here. Um, we're going to continue on with the letter to the Thessalonians, the first letter. For the last two weeks, we've been studying on this letter. And we've been moving kind of slow because there is a lot to unpack in this letter. Um, as we started last week, we talked about a discussion that I wanted to hit about or talk about a little bit this week. Did anybody study that this week? The two-edged sword. No. Nobody. Well, we're going to hit it a little bit later on, but um, I want to make some emphasis on the two-edged sword and John 15 right quick. And I want to tie those two things together and then tie them into the Thessalonians. Yes, sir. Um, I kind of, um, I'm going through Isaiah right now. And um, I'm, let's see, in chapter... Twenty-seven. Uh, it talks about uh, in that day the Lord with his sword and great and uh, strong sword shall punish Leviathan, this piercing serpent, uh, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. And um, then, like uh, I remember reading in Job about Leviathan, uh, and it talks about how no sword could pierce him, or like no spear could pierce him. Uh, but the, the Lord's sword can pierce him. The, uh, the word of God is the only thing that can pierce Leviathan. Leviathan is like symbolic of Satan. Very good. And, uh, I don't know. I just I ran into that. I thought that was really very good. good. And we'll expand on that a little bit more as we, as we move on. John 15. Y'all want to turn there real quick. So John 15 is a very famous passage um, about the true vine. And we know that the Lord Jesus is speaking right here. If you've got a red letter Bible, you know that he's speaking right here. But him being the true vine, I want to read verse 5. He says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. Now, the reason I wanted to bring that up is because as we study the Thessalonians and as we're pondering and meditating on their lives and their testimony, we should know that they knew where power came from. All right. And so when I ask this question right here, did they know where power and life comes from? We know that they know they knew where life came from because they bore fruit. The only way you bear fruit is by being attached to the vine, right? As a, as a, I don't know if anybody does flowery or, or you know, cutting down trees or anything, you know that what Jesus was talking about was, as you go through, he talks about pruning. He talks about clipping the foliage and all, you know, the things off the tree. And what does that do? That makes the tree healthy, you see? And so him being this, the center vine there, the true vine, uh, every branch that's connected to him is going to receive that life, right? The sap in a tree is the same thing. It receives that sap through the branches, and it's the same thing. So the, Thess the fact that the Thessalonians were bearing fruit tells you that they were connected to the true vine. Now, in Matthew 3.10, of a couple weeks ago, we talked about the Lord Jesus wielding an axe, right? John says... He's going to come with an axe, and he's going to put the axe to the root, right? And any tree that doesn't bear fruit, he's going to cast into the fire. So as you can see again, Matthew 3.10 ties in with the Thessalonians as well, that they're bearing fruit, and they will not be chopped down. They're, not, they're going to be chopped to the root. Those people who do not bear fruit will be chopped to the fruit, and the Thessalonians were ones who bore fruit. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to speak on that. To make sure that we know that the Thessalonians had the right formula. They had the right power. They had the right uh, source of power, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. So, a review over what we went over last week. And I want to 
where I want to start is, and I'm not going to go over the whole uh, six verses that we went over, but I just want to hit this one spot right here, review of Paul's entering in. In chapter 1, verse 9, the Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 9, 1 Thessalonians. He says, for they themselves show us of what manner of entering in we had unto you. Now we know that he wrote this letter from Corinth. And in Corinth, of course, we talked about him possibly walking down the street and hearing testimonies, hearing about the word from Thessalonica. Now, what he's talking about right there is them, themselves show of us what manner of entering in. He heard people talking about what manner of entering in, entering in he had with them. And we discussed about chapter 2 down to verse 11. That chapter 2 tells you what manner of entering in he had. And we went over it. And I'll cover that real quick, briefly. Paul and Silas and Timothy entered in already being persecuted. They have already been persecuted through Philippi, through all these different places. They came in not to deceive or to wish after other people's things. They didn't come to covet after their things. They didn't come with guile. They didn't come to trick them or sell them anything. They didn't come to please them, but to deliver the truth, the gospel of God. They didn't come speaking good words and fair speeches. They didn't come seeking glory for themselves. They labored and they travailed and they witnessed and they preached. They behaved holy and just and blame, unblameable and unchargeable. They were gentle. They exhorted. They comforted. They charged. They cherished the Thess Thessalonians as a nurse does the children and taught them as a father does. They were also so desirous of them to be saved that they were willing to give up their own souls for their salvation. Now, we're going to start tonight, verse 12, chapter 2. Why did, what was Paul's purpose for the way he entered into Thessalonica? All these things, when it comes to the way they behaved, the way they acted, the way they preached, the way they talked, the way they conducted themselves, why is it that they were doing that? And in verse 12, it shows you, Paul says, that you may walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. So I'll ask you, while we're walking our everyday lives, we're preaching and teaching people, telling them what God has done for us. Yeah, probably. What God has done for us. We should be the same. We should desire that they walk worthy of God. New Christians, brothers and sisters, our desire should be that they walk worthy of God. Why? Because God is the one who called us into his kingdom and his glory. So, verse 13, we'll continue on. For this cause, also thank we God without ceasing. I put verse 13 up here, and I put chapter 5, verse 17, uh, to add on to that, to pray without ceasing. Paul, if you read through all his letters, was constantly thanking God. He was a thankful man, grateful man for what God had done for him. And when he talks about thanking God without ceasing, I add praying without ceasing. You know, it's very clear that, well, let me ask you this. Is prayer a location? When we pray, is there a certain location we need to be? No. no. It's open, right? It's one of the only things that is open, that's out in the wide open. We can be in the car. We can be on our knees. Some people, some people only pray during a meal, right? Some, there's all these different ways to pray or times to pray. Paul says that prayer is limitless. It has no specific setting. You can pray anywhere. I want Maria's story, the reason I put Maria's story, <laughs> is because I don't know if you guys know, if you don't mind me picking on you, Maria was a Catholic, she was a diehard Catholic, and uh, 
we had a conversation one night when I used to go over there every night when I used to preach the gospel, and we started talking about prayer. And she says, well, I pray all the time. And I said, oh, yeah. I said, well, you know, I don't want to intrude and ask you what kind of prayers you pray or anything like that. But she says, let me show you what I pray. And she takes out this piece of paper, and it's got these prayers on it. You know, these, <laughs> and she says, well, I just say these every night. And, you know, well, I don't think this is what Paul was talking about. There is no thankfulness without ceasing when you're reading off a piece of paper, you see. There's no, you can pray without ceasing by reading off a piece of paper, but there's, is it from the heart? Right. And so thankfulness, humility are from the heart, correct? So I wrote here, the Catholic Church has dropped it. They, they rehearse their well thought out prayers uh, that can be read off a piece of paper. What does that have to do with the heart? I'll ask you this. What does being on your knees praying to God have to do with your heart? Showing you can be on your knees all day praying to God. Showing your humbleness. Your... It does show humility. But can you be on your knees without your heart being on its knees? Yes, definitely. Right. So the Muslim doesn't pray. He prays to God. He he says he prays to God and serves God, and he's on his knees five times a day, but he's not praying to the God of the Bible, correct? Mm -hmm. So, I just want to emphasize that um, Paul is saying there that there is no there is no place when he talks about prayer, <clears throat> prayer without ceasing <clears throat> and be thankful to God without ceasing. <clears throat> so he's thankful to God because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, this is why he's thankful. Are you thankful when you preach the gospel to somebody? Are you thankful that they received the word of God? Or is your mindset, I've preached the gospel today, now I can go home. Right? So Paul was very thankful that they received the word of God. Now, I wrote Matthew 13 up here because the fact that they received the word of God confirms what Jesus was talking about in the parable when he says that the word of God is going to land on certain ground. It's either going to land on stony ground or it's land on thorn, thorns are going to come grab it or it's going to be on good ground. So all these examples of uh, the devil's coming to take the word or the world choking it out or it landing on good ground, the fact that they re Paul says that they received the word and the fact that they bore fruit shows that the seed landed on good ground. And that's all, I, that's all I hope that this church and the preaching and the teaching does here is that the word of God falls on good ground. You see? Can I share something? Yes, sir. I, uh, and, and I'm not going to take the glory for this, but I, uh, I told you I gave a sermon today at uh, the cemetery. And uh, I, I never planned on this because it was just a given to me on a, just the spare of the moment. And I didn't realize, even though I give the sermon, I needed that as much as they needed it. Because not that it made me feel good within myself, but it glorified my Lord. And it made me feel good in that part that, I mean, at least I can show the, the people. When we talk about preaching the public, uh, I mean, they used to be where I, or they're at where I used to be. I mean... I don't know if there was maybe two people in the whole crowd ever even knew who the Lord Jesus Christ was. Mm -hmm. but, but what I liked about it is when God, got, I mean, I didn't even know what I was going to say. And I said things that, matter of fact, I even had to think after I was done what I even said. You know, because sometimes God leads you, and apparently it must have touched a lot of hearts because there was a lot of tears in that today. But I just, I thank my Lord for that, that part. So they received the word, as we continue on, they received the word not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Who knows who Lee Strobel is? Mm -hmm. the, case, the Case for Christ, it just came out with the movie, yeah. Case for Christ, me and my wife watched it. Uh, he's got a book out as well. Well, <clears throat> the thing about Lee Strobel is, is that he's got a very good testimony because he was a he went to law school, and of course we know all lawyers are all about the truth, right? But then he was a journalist, and what was his 
job then? Was it to find the truth? <laughs> you see, so his whole life was kind of this was kind of this in and out of truth. Being a lawyer and being a journalist, <clears throat> they kind of fit fit what they wanted to be true. And his life was the same way. He was an atheist, and he did not believe that <clears throat> God created man. He believed that man created God. You see, and so as he's going through his life. His wife uh, ends up meeting their next door neighbor. Um, they end up meeting. They end, she ends up going to church. Long story short, um, and he ends up investigating because his wife was really on him uh, about, and she was really being convicted, and she was really going. Uh, the Lord was working on her really hard, and so um, it was causing conflict within their household. And so what he wanted to do, his whole purpose was, <clears throat> I'm going to check this out, and I'm going to find the truth so I can prove my wife wrong. Mm -hmm. That was the whole purpose. <clears throat> and so he went into this whole long traveling, I mean, for I think it was six months or something, that he was going to talk to these experts and psychologists and scientists and all these secular people who uh, weren't necessarily, they weren't Christian at all. They were just telling them the truth, you see, and come to find out that... He came to his wife, and he says, i got to let you know that your faith is true. <laughs> you see? I was believing what I thought to be true, mm -hmm. but your faith is true. And so when we were talking about the Thessalonians worshiping idols, we talked about the 5,000 or the 10,000 or how many ever idols there were in Thessalonica. And we talked about them believing that that was true, right? They obviously had to believe it was true. Mm. You're not going to worship a God that you don't believe in. It's true. And so as they were, their lives, as they were, they were worshiping these idols, Paul comes into town. He preaches them the word. And now they see another truth, right? They, they say, now we believe that this is the living and true God. And so, again, we talk about them receiving the word. As Paul came in with power, preaching the word of God, they received it and understood what the truth was. That their truth and their reality was wrong. And that the real truth was that the Lord Jesus Christ is God. So you received it not as the word of men, which the word of men is what? Futile and um, untrustworthy at best. But you received it. In truth, the word of God, which works effectually also in you that believe. I said something the other night that uh, kind of perturbed me as I was as I went back and listened to what I was. I, I kind of go back and listen to make sure that um, to make sure that I'm saying uh, what's in the word of God. Now, I stutter. I'm country and a lot of people can't understand me. Y'all know that. But. What I said was that this book is a book to a lot of people. It's just a book. Right. And it's just words. But there are a lot of PhDs and doc, you know, doctors and people who, who study this thing endlessly. But they never come to the knowledge of the truth. Right? It affects, this, this Bible effectually works in those who believe. It's written to believers. And what it does is it cuts. And there's two types of cutting. If you think about a surgeon, how does a surgeon cut? What does he cut for? He cuts to heal. Mm -hmm. Correct? So the way it effectually works in a Christian or that person that God is working on, it cuts them to heal them. Right? Or it can cut you to kill. A warrior, a knight, takes his sword out to cut to kill. Now, when it says effectually works in you that believe, I, I know that this is the authority by which we live by. I know that this is the authority by which every human being should live by because this is the word of God. This is God speaking to us. But what happens is the two types of cutting, when the word of God is powerful and quick, Sharper than any two-edged sword, right? What happens is, is it comes in and cuts you to heal you for those who believe. But for those who don't, 
it, they are repelled by it. They are combative toward it. They are militant toward, toward it. And so what does it do? The word of God will kill. Now, no, let me, who knows who John Gill is? John Gill. Anybody? Sir? John Gill? He's an he's a old, British, old British pastor, theologian, who made a comment about this. He says, it was called the word of God because God is the author of it. It came from him. It is ministered by his authority and is a part of that written word which is given by his inspiration. And because his grace is choosing, redeeming, justifying, pardoning, adopting, regenerating, and giving eternal life to men, and the declaration of his will concerning them, concerning saving them by his son, Jesus Christ, are the subject matter of it. The subject matter of the word of God is those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who it's being written to. And it may be called the word of God of hearing of God because coming from him, containing his will, preached by his order, succeeded by his power, hearing comes by it, it is divinely breathed by him, he speaks in it by his ministers, and he has heard of it by his people. And as he was by these believers who heard his word both internally and externally, and received it into their understanding, so as to know it spiritually and experimentally into their minds, not merely notionally, and so as to ascend to the truth of it, giving credit to it. So John Gill confirms as well that it affects those who believe in a healing way, but it does not affect those who do not believe in a good way. Can anybody tell me why? No. Wouldn't be that. I guess what I'm saying is this. It's going to repel or it's going to attract. God is going to draw people in with it and push people away with it. You see? There's no way that Lee Strobel comes to the knowledge of God without God drawing him. Right? Drawing him into his word. Right. And so he gets into the word and realizes the truth. You got the PhD and the doctor who read this every day, but they're reading it for a different purpose, you see. And so what's it going to do to them? They're going to completely reject it, and because of that, they'll be damned. It's going to condemn them. It's going to judge them. So, yes? Um, one of the uh, things about like the word of God being a sword is uh, like physical swords can only cut through... Uh, just your body through flesh and like the word of God is something that cuts down to the soul right. it, it cuts down to the soul and when I guess like when you receive a, a cut that goes down to your soul you really see who you are and for those who believe for like saved Christians us seeing who we are makes us want to change who we are uh, for those who don't believe, who aren't saved, um, and reject the word of God, them seeing who they are really upsets them, and uh, they don't like it, and like that's sort of the reason why I feel they reject it. Like they see themselves, and they don't like themselves. Very good. I, either way, whether you're saved or not saved, I think that the Bible is offensive. Mm -hmm. Why is it offensive? Because we still have flesh. We still have an old man who is rejecting everything of the spirit. And so when we read, it still it, it doesn't offend me in the way that an unsaved man is offended, but it offends me in a way that it wants me, it wants to, it's cutting me in a way to change and to heal. So, continuing on. Verse 14. For you, brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have 
of the Jews. So Paul, here's an example of Acts 17, 6. You don't have to turn there. I'll turn there. Of what he's talking about when he says that the Jews were persecuting them. Acts 17, 6. We know that Paul in Thessalonica stayed with Jason in the house of Jason. And that's where the church was to begin with. If that's where it stayed, I don't know. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took them by certain lewd fellows of the baser sword and gathered a company and set all the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of David and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, saying that these have turned the world upside down and are come here also. So there was persecution of the church after Paul got kicked out. Right? And he's saying right here that your own countrymen have persecuted you the same way that the Jews did to the churches of Judea. That we're all under the same umbrella of Jesus Christ and we're all being persecuted. Verse 15. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. So... What's interesting about this is that not too long ago, well, I'll say not too long ago, but years prior, Paul was in this company. He was the one persecuting Christians. <laughs> he was the one that could have said about himself, it was my fathers who killed the prophets. <laughs> and we killed the Lord Jesus. He could have said that. But obviously you see that, that Paul has been changed, and now he's projecting it on them. He's saying the Jews, them. See, obviously we know because he said there's no such thing. Uh, there's no difference between a Jew and a Gentile now. So, But Paul is confirming what Peter and Stephen said right here. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. So Peter in Acts 3.13 says this. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers hath glorified his son Jesus, who, del who you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. So did he confirm what Peter said? Yes. He said that the Jews are the ones that delivered him up. Peter speaking, he's preaching to the Jews. He even said that Pilate was willing to let him go. A lot of people say that Pontius Pilate killed him. Well, he's the one that gave the order. But the Jews out of envy, Pilate knew that the Jews out of envy wanted him dead and crucified. But because of insurrection and because of uh, it was his job to keep the peace, he went along with it. But Peter says that it was you who delivered him up and denied him in the presence of Pilate. You see? The Jews. And Stephen said the same thing. Being full of the Holy Spirit, he stands in front of the Sanhedrin, and he tells them, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now betrayers and murderers. He confirms both Peter and Stephen. And as you go through here, Paul actually talks about, uh, in Acts, he actually talks to the Jews. When he's talking to the Jews, he's confessing what he did to Stephen. But it's just interesting how all the stories, all the, the witnessing, and all of the, con the, the confirming that's going on in this one passage of Scripture right here, you can go back and read how it's confirming everything throughout the Scripture. They, continuing on, they pleased not God. So the Jews, according to Romans 11, he says that they are enemies of the gospel for our sakes. But because of the fathers, they're elect. And that's a, I don't know if you can correct me on this, sir, but that's a, Romans 11 is about national salvation. And so, but it does, it's very interesting when it says that the Jewish, the, the nation of Israel, where the Jew is from, that they're enemies of the gospel. And obviously they don't please God because they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not pleasing to God. They're enemies of God if 
they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So Acts 22 is when Paul went back to Jerusalem. And when he was in Jerusalem, there was a, a gang of Asian Jews that came down to the temple and they, um, they saw him giving the Nazarite vow. And when, he, when they were in there, they said, this is the man that brought a Greek, a Gentile, into the temple. And so they took him and they started beating him. But when they started beating him, Roman soldiers came and basically put him in chains and rescued him. And they were going to arrest him, but he said, let me speak to these Jews. And when he spoke to them, what he said was, I'll tell you what he said. And he said unto them, well, this is, and he gave them audience of his, unto his word, and then lifted up their voice. Let me go back. Paul has given the story that Jesus, the Lord Jesus, while he was in the temple, the Lord Jesus tells him to get out, to depart. I will sing you far unto the Gentiles so they can hear the gospel. And as he gave them audience unto this word, they lifted up their voice and said, Away with this fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. The Jews hated the Gentiles. And if you read all through Jewish history, they did not like the Gentiles. And even the Judaizers, when the Gentiles were being preached to, the Judaizers were coming up telling them that they needed to follow the law. So it's very interesting that they were forbidding them. I don't know if that's... They were persecuting them, or they were speaking to them, you will not do this, or they were hindering them in whatever way. But he says that they were forbidding them not to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. To fill up their own sins always. The Lord Jesus talks about the filling up of sins. That the fathers... Continue on. The Lord Jesus talks about the Jews filling up their sins by what the fathers did. And then it says, for the wrath is to come upon them to the uttermost. Now, I read a commentary saying that the wrath is not necessarily the wrath of God at the end of time, you know, but the wrath that's to come, which is the destroying of everything that they are about. Their ceremonies, their rituals, their traditions, the temple, all that. Verse 17, but we, brethren, being taken from you a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. So we know from the last couple of weeks that Paul was very affectionate to these people. He loved them dearly. And even though he wasn't there, he wanted them to let he wanted to let them know that he was there in spirit and in heart. And I'm sure every one of you in here have been somewhere. But you've actually been somewhere else in heart. When I was in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, I was here in heart with my family. <laughs> but obviously I was over there in war. So um, I endeavored to abundantly, you know, I wanted to see them. Uh, but Paul, being a nurse and being a father and all the, the persecution that he endured with them, uh, the building of that church with them, and of course their faithfulness. And what he, what he saw out of them and heard from them when Timothy and Silas came back, he wanted to see them. He loved them dearly. Verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Now, I don't know what the hindering of Satan was. It doesn't specifically say, but I wrote up there Athens and Corinth. So, as he gets kicked out of Thessalonica... He gets kicked, he, the Jews kick him out and he goes to Berea. And then when he's in Berea, they kick him out again and he goes down to Athens. And so it's like Paul is being spiritually and physically, he's being pushed away, right? Farther and farther away from him. And he's saying right there that I wanted, I would have come back, but Satan is hindering me. I go to Athens, 
I get there, and they're wanting to debate me all day long about what God is this and what kind of, what, you know, um, we've never heard this before. Tell us more, you know. And so he stayed there in the Aragopagus and, and preached to them. And then after a short time, he, he gets pushed down to Corinth. He goes to Corinth. When he's down there, of course, there's a lot of things going on in that, that place down there while he's trying to set up the church. Um, um, who was it that came down uh, from Rome? Forget their names. Um, anybody help me? Who came from Rome? The two, the, the husband and wife that. Priscilla and, and Aquila, yes. He came, they came down there. He met them, and there's, there's all kind of things going on. So Paul is letting them know, I would have come back. I want to come back. I desire to see you, but Satan is hindering me, and he's hindering us from coming back to you. Verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? Man. Man. That's a humble thing to say. Most people would say, my hope is to be in the presence of the Lord. Right? That's what most people would say. But we know Paul being a humble man and his, his disciples being humble as well. That their hope and their joy and their rejoicing is others in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. And we talked about Paul... Saying that I would give my own soul, we would give our own souls to see you saved. We talked about Moses in the wilderness in, in Israel saying, blot my name out to save these people. This is the same thing. For you are our glory and our joy. That's an awesome statement. Paul's joy and rejoicing and hope is that they stand in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to ask you, ask yourself. As we are presenting the gospel, as we are telling people about the Lord, <clears throat> are we praying for them and hoping that they are going to be standing in the presence of the Lord? Or again, are we preaching the gospel to hear our own voice? See, Paul didn't do that. <clears throat> so we're going to continue on to verse or, uh, chapter 3. We move on. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. And sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Now, again, he's going back and telling you what has happened. Remember, if we're looking over Paul's shoulder, he's writing this from Corinth. He's already sent Timothy up and Silas up to Thessalonica. They get the report and they come back. And this is when he starts writing this letter. All right? And so he starts telling them basically the history of what's happened. And so as he sends Timothy up there, he commends Timothy on being a minister of God and a fellow laborer of the gospel of Christ. And he sends them to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. We know that the Thessalonians were concerned about a lot of different things. They were concerned about what happens after death. Uh, their loved ones, what's going to happen to them after they die when the Lord Jesus comes back. There was a lot of things that they were concerned about. And so Timothy's job was to go up there and comfort them and to establish them and set them uh, in a place. Now, did Timothy know all the answers? I guess not. Because he came back and said, this is what, these are the questions that they have. And then he ends up writing the letter and answering the questions. So Timothy did, didn't know all the answers. He had to confide in Paul for that. Verse 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed there, uh, thereunto. You do not hear this in the churches a lot today, that persecution and suffering is a part of the Christian life. People in this world do not like the truth, and we've talked about this over and over, that <clears throat> people are threatened by the truth. They have their own truth, but the truth, like a cutting sword, cuts them in a way where they repel it, and they don't want to hear it, and it affects them greatly. And so what do they do? It's amazing what they do and what they've done over history is they would actually kill people, and they would put people in jail. There was a lot of things going on. 
And I forget, I think I told y'all one time that there was an American pastor who said one time that the problem with the Christian church today in America is that nobody's getting killed. Now, I don't think that he wants people to get killed. I'm not saying that. But what he's saying is that the gospel is not being preached the way they preach the gospel. You see, it's a watered down gospel. So that no man should be moved by these afflictions. He wants to make sure that they are comforted and knowing that this is their lot. That when the Lord Jesus Christ converts them, that it is now their job to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, to every creature. But through that process, they will be persecuted. Yes. Uh, it reminds me of the verse. It's in one of the epistles uh, to Timothy, I believe. Uh, like, all who would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yes. Like, I notice it's a shall. It's a promise. It's right. not a you may suffer persecution. It's a you shall suffer persecution. Right. Verse 4. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that you should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. Is that the great tribulation that he's talking about? He's talking about tribulation. Period. It's going to happen, right? The, Jew, the people are going to chase you out. They're not going to like what you say. They like their idols. They like their sin. So they don't want to hear the truth. Even as it came to pass, as we just seen in Acts 17, they chased, they brought Jason and the church out, the people of Thessalonica out. They brought them out, took them to the magistrate, persecuting them. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, by, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. These were new Christians. It's very important that as an older Christian, that somebody who's been a Christian for a while comes alongside the younger Christian. Why? Because the tempter will come and tempt you. And what will that cause? It will cause, um, it will cause them to stray. It's like this. If I was a drunk at one time, when I become a Christian, believe you me, that in the spirit realm, I guess you could say, Satan is coming after you. All right? And the way he's going to come after you is not, uh, it's not like most people think. How he's going to come after you is you're going to come out of the church house one day and you're going to go down to you, you know, your house or whatever and you, all your boys are going to be there. And when you get there, they're going to be like, hey, it's time. You remember, on, you remember at noon on Sunday every other, you know, for, for five years we've been going drinking. You see? And that's what's going to happen. So we have to have, we have to come alongside those, as Paul sent Timothy, to know their faith. He sent Timothy to come alongside them and make sure that their labor was not in vain. That the tempter wasn't coming in and crushing everything that was going on that, that they had established there. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity... And that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our afflictions and distress by your faith. So Paul is, as Timothy comes back and gives him the report, he is very comforted to know that they have stuck to it. That they have <clears throat> received the word of God in faith and they are continuing on. I don't know if you guys know, there's a guy named um, uh, Eric, not Eric Dickerson, Daniel Erickson. I get his name wrong all the time. Daniel Erickson is a pastor in England recently. I told you guys when we were discussing Pope Francis that he exposed him, all right? He exposed him for what he was, and there was an international arrest order. This is recent. International arrest order. They arrested him and they put him in a Romanian prison and he's there for nine months. But before he goes there, he starts, he, there's a ministry that God called him to do to go preach to these Bulgarian children. And all these children are receiving the word of God and they're all preaching the word of God. I mean, they, you know, you can watch these videos of them, you can listen to them live. But these kids are getting converted. And it's, a, and it's a miraculous thing going on. And so what's happening, and he's living in England, 
And because they're chasing him down, he goes to stay with the children and with this, the friends that he's made in Bulgaria. Well, when he gets there, they, the Bulgarian police get him and they put him in a Bulgarian prison. And he's there for nine months. Well, all throughout the time that he's in prison, his sister is giving these reports. And she's saying, you know, there's tears, of course, there's weeping, but she's saying that we don't know where he's at. We don't know what's going on with him. We don't know. And slowly but surely, they start making contact with him. <clears throat> and then they bring him to a prison in England. And when he gets there, they give him a Bible and they let him start preaching to the guards. You see? And so this slow progression. But what happens is, is he gets out and he puts out this video and he says, I want to tell you all something. The first thing I did was went back and seen the children. The first thing I did was went back to see if what I had established, what God had established through me in that ministry, if it was concrete and if it was true. And when he did, when he showed up, I mean, you can watch these videos. There are tenfold children. There are tenfold people in the streets celebrating as he's coming through, you see, to welcome him back. So it's an amazing thing. And Paul is saying the same thing right here, that Timothy went back to establish you, to make sure your faith is concrete, and to make sure that, that what we have done is not in vain. And when he has come back, it's a great, great thing. Because I see, and I'm comforted, that through all your affliction and distress, your faith stands firm. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. And we'll end it right there tonight. But... We can go on and on and on. The, the Thessalonians, as we're going to continue to see, that they were firm in their faith. They were firm in their faith, but they had questions. As new Christians, when we have people coming to this church who, first, second time, they hear about the Lord, they're converted, they're going to have questions. They're going to come to you, Jonathan, and they're going to say, what about this? What, what is it about... Uh, and they can ask you anything. Sir, Ron Michael, what is it about this? Or can you answer this for me? Paul, I'm not saying that we can, that we're going to get a revelation of God because this is the revelation from God, right? So what we're going to be able to do is use Paul's answers to the Thessalonians or use Paul's answers to the Corinthians because it comes from God. And they have the same questions that any Christian is going to have, new Christian. And so we're going to see as we continue on that their questions are answered. A lot of times they're answered in a way that takes a lot of understanding, takes a lot of study. Paul is not, it's not very clear in a lot of things. But we can use these scriptures, and that is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to live by them. We're, these, are, these are our answers. And so we're not answering them on our own. We're not going to go out and seek a secular source. We're going to seek the word of God and answer their questions based off the same way Paul did, seeking God, yes. And I don't mean to be stupid, but here in Galatians, where 2, 11, and 13, was, was Christ already crucified uh, during that time? Yes. Galatians 2, I wrote that up there because the, when we're speaking about the Jews hating the Gentiles, Peter went in Galatians 2, he's up in Antioch eating with the Gentiles. He's having meals with them. And James and a group of I guess you could call them the, uh, the, the pillars uh, of the church. All these men are Jews, all right? And so this group with James comes up to Antioch, and when they get there, they see Peter eating with Gentiles, and what does he do? He runs. He takes off. And Barnabas does too. He takes a group of them. Why did they do that? Because they knew what the Jews thought about the Gentiles, you see? And so... I just brought that point out to show you that them forbidding Paul to speak to the Gentiles was because they hated the Gentiles. And I wrote something down. I didn't read it to you, and I'm sorry I didn't read it to you. There's a man named James Everett. And in 1912, he said in a commentary, he said that the Jews thought it was appalling that the Gentiles could receive the true Messiah. They thought it was appalling. They, think, they thought that it was appalling that a Gentile teach the law. They said it was he, that he was worthy of death if he taught the law. So you can see their attitude towards the Gentiles. 
And I have to be honest with you, it's the same way today. Jews, uh, uh, it's not as, uh, it's probably not as prominent as it was back then, but if you've ever looked through the Talmud, the Halakha, the Haggadah, all the, the Talmud, you can tell that they do not like Gentiles. Do you know, I mean, how many years you think where Christ was crucified, where Peter, because wasn't it Peter, when the Lord said, you'll deny me three times for the cockroach Christ, wasn't that Peter that said that to the Lord? Yes. Well, so the Lord how, how many years do you, was there when Christ was crucified, and when you get into Galatians there, was a span in between, do you know? The, it says 14, well, we can look there. You know it has to be at least 14 years after, after Paul has been saved. The reason that is is because up because Acts, it, in, in Acts after his conversion, it says, it, it'll say right after that that he went to Jerusalem. But they, you have to put Galatians in that because what happened is, is when he gets converted, he goes to Damascus, and when he's converted and baptized and his eyes are open, he immediately goes to Arabia. See? And he goes out there and he receives a revelation apparently. Actually, I'm not so sure, sure it wasn't a total of 17 after his conversion, because <clears throat> it was three years later, you know, where he first, you know, when he met with Peter. Right. After he came back to, okay. right. So, I mean, you're looking at, it could be 17 years, and it could be longer than that, because he goes down to Jerusalem, he's there for 15 days, goes back to Antioch, and then, so, it's a long time. It's a while that Galatians 2 happens after the, the death of the Lord Jesus. You know, one of the things that impressed me with what he said here, read, uh, you know, he said, I can no longer forbear. He was really concerned because he knew that they'd gone through persecution, and he had already dealt with people who, when they had, or had anything contrary, when someone else came and said something contrary to him, what he had said, uh, some of those people had turned on him, mm -hmm. and he was concerned, have they, have these folks turned on me, and so I gotta know. So he sends Timothy, you know, and Timothy right. comes back and says, hey, they really care for you. They, they want to see you. They really have an affection for you. And you can imagine that comfort. Right. It's like a person having to go to a physician and wondering what you're going to hear. And then, <laughs> right. That's awesome. And, and that's how much of a heart he had for them. Right. That's awesome. Well, there's one thing here, uh, maybe this is me, you know, when we talk about the temptation part and being a drunk, and I, you know, I shared this with you and told you. I, I was a, a, a block and a half from the bar, and this was after that desire that God took from me, and, and it was just clear. But I knew, it, like he gives you a, an insight for where he knew that where you could really stand it. I could go into a bar and eat a sandwich a day and never even think about drinking a beer or anything else. But during that first five years, I, I was a block and a half from the bar and I could smell the beer. I mean, it was just, it was like it was drawing me like a magnet. And it was a thing that I knew until that desire, that, that thought that was so heavy in, in my soul was gone, that I dared not to go to a bar, and I wouldn't. But now I can walk into one and walk out of one and still be clean. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Lord worked on you. Yes, he has. <laughs> Are there any questions? I know this is a little faster tonight. Are there any questions or concerns, comments? Again, as we... Continue on through these letters, I want to make sure that you ponder and meditate not on what I'm saying per se, but what God's saying in here. So go back and read it yourself. If you come up with uh, God tells you something else uh, that can be brought out so we can all benefit from, from, from the letter, then we'd like to discuss that. But we talked about meditating. We talked about pondering. Make sure that when we go home and we read this for ourselves that we're, how is it that I apply 
these same principles, these same things that Paul's talking about to me and our church. So, and as we've seen, you can apply almost every sentence to what he's saying to the Thessalonians, to this church, and to yourself. So, questions? Concerns? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege and opportunity to come and even say one word out of this book that has been inspired by you. And we thank you for the Apostle Paul and what you have given him, given him to write and how it can inspire us and how we can meditate on your word and get a clear understanding of what you expect out of us and how we should conduct ourselves as godly men and women. I thank you for everybody here. I pray that you um, give a special blessing to everybody that came. I pray over the prayer list tonight, Lord, that you would see to it that, you're, that all these people, whatever is according to your will, Lord, that um, they would be healed or um, whatever your will is, that I pray that you open up our hearts and our minds and help us to understand that we are nothing without you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.